Arthur, are you even listening? Just sign the papers, and we'll be done. Annie's voice, which I'd heard for over 25 years of marriage, was distant as she spoke. I struggled to focus on her words amid the growing distance between us. It all began this afternoon when I returned from work. Annie sat at the table, a determined expression on her face, with a glass of wine in hand. But she hadn't thought to pour me one, despite the impending weight of our conversation. Sitting down, I knew it wouldn't be an easy talk. She wasted no time informing me that she was leaving, having found her soulmate, someone who stirred emotions in her that I apparently never did. Her voice grew louder, but to me, it seemed to fade. Our story was conventional. High school sweethearts, we'd stayed together, had a daughter, Sally, shortly after marrying. While not rich, we were comfortable. Our love, while perhaps not as fiery as in our youth, was evident in our family vacations and regular expressions of affection. Annie's voice grew more insistent, demanding I sign the papers in front of me. Despite her urgency, I struggled to focus. It was as though the world around me dimmed, despite the bright kitchen lights. Internally, turmoil brewed, but outwardly, I was numb. Annie's frustration peaked, culminating in a slap I barely registered. The blow would surely leave a mark, but I couldn't feel it. Darkness crept in as the world faded. Sally The drive home from university had been tiresome due to an accident. Upon arrival, the house was strangely silent. Dad sat at the table, motionless, amidst an open bottle of wine and a stack of papers. Approaching Dad from behind, I gently touched his shoulder. No response. Walking around to face him, I was alarmed by his distant gaze, tear streaks on his cheeks, and a line of drool trailing from his mouth. Dad. Please, wake up. Panic surged as I struggled to elicit a response, tears welling in my eyes. Realizing I needed to act, I steadied myself. Calm down, Sally. Dad needs help. Dialing emergency services, I relayed the situation, providing our details and address. As I waited for the ambulance, memories flooded my mind. Dad, always present at my school events, endured my early violin practice sessions with unwavering support. His gift of a Heidersign violin on my 16th birthday held deep sentimental value, symbolizing his sacrifices for my passion. Glancing at the divorce papers, I was stunned. Why would Mom want to leave Dad? The revelation soured my emotions, eroding any remaining sympathy for her. When the ambulance arrived, I guided them in transporting Dad to the hospital. Locking up the house, I notified family, friends, and Dad's workplace, conveying the situation and his impending absence from work. Everyone wanted updates on Dad's condition, and his manager assured me he'd arrange emergency leave and inform their boss. Despite my anger towards her, I knew I had to call Mom. The phone rang, and after a few rings, she answered. Hi, Sally. Darling, how was your day? Her casual tone infuriated me. It had only been an hour since I found Dad at home, and Mom knew my schedule well enough to know I'd discover him. Where are you, Mom? I'm out and about, sweetie. Her response trailed off, evasive. So, in other words, you've shattered Dad, your husband, and walked out on him without a second thought? Mom tried to downplay it, but finding Dad as I did suggested otherwise. It seems you abandoned him when he needed help. Are you that heartless? Do you even care? My anger began to surface. Sally, dear, don't get upset. Your father will be fine. I only want what's rightfully mine and some support while I'm with Paul. My mother seemed detached from reality. You haven't seen anger yet, mother. Dad's in an ambulance headed to the hospital. When I found him, he looked like he had a stroke. I'm sorry to hear that, but no excuses, mother. Is this the same Paul from your work you've been talking about? Her hesitation confirmed it. So, you've been having an affair with a man a dozen years younger than you for the past six months, deceiving Dad and me. I had no idea you were capable of this betrayal, and neither did Dad, judging by his condition. How did you think we'd react? Well, at first, don't even try to justify it. Once you're living with Paul, you'll realize we're meant to be together. 
Her use of we infuriated me further. Did she expect me to abandon dad for her boyfriend? I could feel my anger boiling over, and I knew I needed to calm down before saying something regrettable. I'm going to end this call before I say something I regret, I stated firmly. But let me make it clear, I will not abandon dad, and I have no intention of going anywhere near Paul, let alone the place you're whoring away in with him. Sally Other, my mother exclaimed, offended. I'm your mother, and I won't tolerate being spoken to like that. Then I guess we're done talking, I replied, hanging up before she could say more. If she expected me to condone her actions, she was mistaken. She attempted to call me back several times, then started calling Dad's phone, despite the unlikelihood of him answering her call. I ignored her calls, holding onto Dad's phone. When I reached the hospital, Dad had been admitted, and Aunt Rhonda was there. She informed me of the calls she'd received from Mom, though she wasn't fully aware of the situation. After explaining, Aunt Rhonda's face turned scarlet with anger. Sally, do you have the documents your mother left? she asked. Yeah, here, I said, handing them over. Aunt Rhonda, being our family attorney, spent the next hour reading through them and making notes, occasionally muttering under her breath. Doctors and nurses came in and out, checking on Dad. The bad news is your mother is proceeding with the divorce, Aunt Rhonda said. It's been in motion for over two months and had to be served this week to avoid additional legal fees. I shrugged, already having enough justification for Mom's actions. She and Dad were headed for separation because of what she'd done. On the bright side, Aunt Rhonda continued, Mom had hired an incompetent lawyer, while Dad had the best in town at a family discount. Some of these claims she's making, like 50% of the house's equity and 60% of financial assets, plus spousal and child support, are likely exaggerated, Aunt Rhonda explained. And given your reaction, I assume you won't be living with your mother? I shook my head. No, definitely not. Good, Aunt Rhonda said. I have some initial thoughts, but let's wait and see what happens with your dad over the next 24 hours. Your mother could already be in legal trouble for abandonment and mental cruelty. The days passed quickly, with doctors regularly checking on dad. Physically, he was in good health, but he remained unresponsive. I managed to study for university while sitting by his bed, laptop, and textbook in hand. Occasionally, family members would relieve me, allowing me to go home, rest, and return. I admit I shed a few tears alone at home. One surprise visitor was Tina Williams, the owner of the company where Dad worked. Though I knew his manager, Tom, I had never met Tina before. She was an impressive woman, with a striking appearance, voluptuous yet not overweight, with tan skin, dark hair, and captivating blue eyes. Tina had come to check on Dad because he had been part of a group at work who supported her during her messy divorce years ago. Dad had introduced her to Aunt Rhonda, who had helped her navigate the legal complexities and retain her assets, including her business and child support for her daughter. Tina visited Dad several times, bringing cards from his co-workers and sharing stories from work. It turned out Dad was known for his humor in the office, and everyone missed his presence. Dad worked as an accountant for a financial clearinghouse, handling payments between banks and financial institutions. While his job could be tedious, he brightened the workday for everyone with his jokes and cheerful demeanor. One afternoon, when I returned from a shower and nap at home, I found Rhonda and Tina finishing a conversation. They seemed irritated, but their frustration was directed at my mother, not each other. My mother had sent a demand letter to Tina, seeking access to Dad's past bonuses. Ignoring the fact that the bonuses had already been paid, she demanded 50% of them within 30 days or threatened legal action. Rhonda smirked, besides the absurdity of the demand for already paid funds, it seems she and her new partner are short on cash since I froze all the joint assets while Arthur is incapacitated. I chuckled, announcing my presence. This morning, I received my first message from Mom in two weeks, a text asking for a few thousand dollars. I haven't responded because I'm still quite upset with her. Not once has she asked about Dad since I told her what she did to him. Tina had become very defensive of my dad over the last couple of weeks. Whenever my mother, whenever any other's name came up, Tina's expression would darken and her voice would take on a low, intense tone, revealing her deep disdain for Annie. 
It was as if I could visualize flames flickering around her smoldering eyes. I silently hoped Tina would never have to face my mother in person. I feared she might unleash her fiery wrath upon her. Despite my current feelings toward my mother, she was still my mother. She has destroyed the most wonderful man. Sally, if it weren't for your father, I would not have my Clarice or my business. Many in the office supported me during one of the lowest points in my life, but your father went above and beyond. He listened to me without judgment, never offering unsolicited advice. He introduced me to your aunt here, ensuring I was taken care of. If you were single, I would have pursued him relentlessly after my divorce. I shrugged, a smile spreading across my face. He won't be married much longer. Realization dawned on their faces, and Rhonda chuckled while Tina smiled gratefully. Thank you, Sally. I needed that. I still can't believe what your mother has done to him or how she could discard such an amazing man. I must get back to the office, but before I do... Tina walked over to my dad and, to the surprise of Rhonda and me, gave him a gentle yet heartfelt kiss on the lips. She glanced up at us, her smile fading into shock a moment later when Dad groaned. Arthur. As I slowly regained consciousness, I felt soft lips pressing against mine with just the right amount of pressure, conveying a tenderness I hadn't felt in a long time. The beeping of hospital equipment filled the room, and I groaned as I felt soreness in almost every muscle. Expecting to see Annie standing over me after such a loving kiss, I opened my eyes to find Tina with a smile on her face. Tina? Sally and Rhonda approached from the other side of the bed. It's okay, Daddy. You're going to be okay, understand? Memories flooded back, and I realized Annie was leaving me, or perhaps had already left. What happened? For the next few minutes, they filled me in on Sally finding me unresponsive, calling an ambulance, and discovering the divorce papers indicating Annie's infidelity. I learned how Annie had threatened Tina once Rhonda secured our finances until they knew my condition. How long? Two weeks, Arthur, Rhonda replied. I turned to Tina. Um, did you kiss me? Tina blushed. Yes, sorry. I was about to leave for the office and was saying goodbye. I smiled. No, it's okay. I guess I'm back on the market, so it's fine. Throughout the next few hours, a parade of doctors filed in to examine me, conducting physical checkups and blood tests. Tina canceled her plans for the office and stayed by my side, along with Rhonda and Sally. Among the medical professionals was a psychologist who listened as I recounted coming home to find Annie drinking alone and announcing she was leaving me. As her words grew more forceful, the world seemed to lose its vibrancy, colors faded, sounds dulled, and moving became difficult despite my growing distress. My last memory was of Annie slapping and yelling at me, her words incomprehensible. The girls gasped collectively at the revelation of Annie's abuse while I lay unresponsive. Daddy, do you remember what time it was when you couldn't respond anymore? Sally asked. I'd say around 5.30, baby. Why? I replied. Because it was after 7.30 when I found you at home, and there was no red mark on your cheek, so I assume Mom must have left you there alone for quite some time. The psychologist interjected, explaining that it's not uncommon for someone in my situation to experience abuse while unresponsive, especially given the shock of Annie's declaration. Rhonda shared a childhood incident where I had been teased by a bully and later found lying unconscious in a park, waking up the next day as if nothing had happened. I remember that, I said, recalling the bully's apology the following day. I think we might have some precedent here, the psychologist remarked, suggesting that the mind's response could be a defense mechanism. Feeling tired despite just waking from a two-week sleep, I sent the girls home to rest, promising they could visit me the next day. Over the following two days, I eased back into life. Tina provided me with work tasks to keep me occupied, Rhonda reviewed divorce documents and collected my signatures, and she also introduced me to a young detective named Karen Hill. Detective Hill conducted a thorough interview with me about the events involving Annie that night, expressing gratitude before informing Rhonda and me that her report would be ready in a few days. Uncertain if we were pursuing a complaint against Annie, Rhonda reassured me to leave it in her hands, kissing my forehead before departing. 
On the second day after my awakening from what Sally dubbed my checkout, I was discharged to return home. Tina surprised me by meeting us at the door and assisting Sally in escorting me to her large suburban SUV. Tina stayed for dinner that night, joining us for takeout and helping with cleanup before spending a few hours watching TV. As she prepared to leave, Sally hugged her, insisting I accompany Tina to her car. Tina, thank you for everything you've done these past few weeks. I don't know how to repay you, I expressed my gratitude. Well, in a few weeks, when you're feeling back to normal, you can take me out for dinner and dancing. Tina suggested, her proposal catching me off guard. Blushing, I agreed to her offer, scheduling our outing for the following Friday. As she hugged me goodbye, I sensed a deeper meaning behind the gesture. Watching her drive off, I chuckled at the momentary lapse in memory regarding Annie's name, despite our lengthy marriage. In the following days, Sally, Rhonda, and Tina continued to ensure my well-being, their care providing comfort during my recovery. However, Rhonda's unexpected news that Friday afternoon left us all taken aback. Annie was arrested this afternoon. Rhonda announced. Surprised, I inquired about the circumstances. Rhonda explained that following my statement to the police, an arrest warrant was issued for Annie on charges of mental cruelty to a person with a disability, citing my inability to defend myself at the time. With Annie's actions of leaving me unattended exacerbating the situation, she found herself in significant trouble. Concerned about the implications for the divorce, Tina, who had joined us for dinner once again, raised the question. As we discussed, her daughter Clarice watched a Disney movie nearby. With my return to work scheduled for Monday, I couldn't help but notice Tina's subtle advances, realizing she might be interested in more than just a competent colleague in the office. The thought of Tina lingered in my mind, along with curiosity about what lay beneath her stylish attire. Rhonda smiled, outlining the potential advantages for me. She aimed for a fair 50-50 split of assets, considering my inclination toward fairness. Annie's attempt to claim bonus money from Tina was countered with a case of extortion alongside the mental cruelty charge, preventing her access to what wasn't rightfully hers. Rhonda's strategy involved expediting the divorce process, leveraging my hospitalization and recovery as a pretext. She assured us it should take about three months, with the option to escalate if Annie contested. Sally inquired about the timeline, to which Rhonda estimated around three months, with potential for prolongation if contested. That evening, as I escorted Tina to her car, she surprised me with a brief kiss, expressing her long-standing desire for me while respecting my marriage vows. Reciprocating her feelings, I kissed her passionately, affirming my acceptance of her affection. Sally and Clarice witnessed the moment, adding to the joy with their laughter and applause. In the ensuing months, the divorce proceedings unfolded with Annie's shifting demands. Influenced by Paul, she pushed for an unfair settlement, which Rhonda swiftly addressed with a single call to Annie's lawyer, prompting a change in stance overnight. Meanwhile, Tina and I enjoyed weekly dates, with Sally's assistance in babysitting Clarice. Though our interactions remained chaste, anticipation built for the day my divorce would be finalized. Now that I was back at work, things were going smoothly. Our financial organization was profitable, though not among the top tier. We all did our jobs well, enjoyed decent pay, and had a good camaraderie. It seemed the staff had caught wind of Tina and me becoming an item, but while everyone was supportive, I had to dial back my usual antics. My direct manager, who reported to Tina, made sure to remind me of appropriate workplace behavior, given my relationship with his boss. About three and a half months later, we received notice that the divorce would be finalized in a week. Annie requested a meeting before the decree, and I agreed, arranging for her to visit our house to speak with both Sally and me. I took the afternoon off work to prepare lamb chops and gnocchi, a favorite meal for all of us, hoping to ease the tension of our conversation. Sally arrived home around 5.30, while Annie showed up just before 6. Now, let me describe Annie. Before everything happened, she was an attractive mid-40s housewife with shoulder-length brown hair, a curvy figure, and an appealing physique. However, the woman before me now was almost unrecognizable. Annie had gained a significant amount of weight, with sagging jowls and puffy cheeks. Her once-toned stomach now hung over her pants, and her curvy figure had expanded. She wore baggy clothes that concealed even more. 
My shock must have been evident on my face, though Annie didn't comment. Hello, Annie, please come in, I greeted her, leading her to the kitchen where I offered her a glass of wine, which she accepted. We engaged in small talk for a few minutes, with Annie mentioning that her weight gain was what Paul wanted. Despite everything, I couldn't help but feel some concern for her well-being, albeit significantly diminished after what she had put me through. You don't approve, do you? She asked, meeting my gaze. No, Annie, I don't. When we were together, you were a healthy size, but I must admit, I'm taken aback by your appearance now. You don't look well, and though I'm hurt by what you did, a part of me still cares about your health and well-being. But you don't care, do you? Annie's expression fell. You and Sally, you're happy and healthy without me here. Well, there's a part of me that does care, but after you walked out on me and left me in such a state. I trailed off, shrugging. She sighed. I deserve that. I did a terrible thing, didn't I? No, mother, Sally interjected, appearing from the shower. You did a dreadful thing. You tore our family apart single-handedly, then left without a second thought, and I can't fathom why Dad agreed to this meeting tonight. Sally, calm down. Your mother knows the situation, and she's made an effort to talk to us. Let's be mature and hear her out, I intervened. Sally was visibly upset. Like me, she hadn't spoken to her mother since that day. The tension in the room was palpable, so I suggested we focus on dinner to ease the atmosphere. During dinner, silence prevailed, with occasional glances exchanged across the table. Sally's glare at her mother didn't waver. After the meal, I began clearing the table, and Annie asked to speak with Sally alone. No way. Whatever you have to say, say it in front of both of us. Sally retorted firmly. I was torn, but it was clear Sally didn't want to be alone with her mother. Annie seemed to understand, nodding in agreement. Taking a deep breath, Annie addressed Sally, expressing her desire for forgiveness and acknowledging her mistakes. Then, she hesitated, indicating there was more she wished to discuss privately. Sorry, mother, but if you can't say it to both of us, then I don't want to hear it, Sally asserted before leaving the room abruptly. I had hoped for a better outcome, Annie murmured, more to herself than to me. I think it went as well as could be expected, I replied, trying to reassure her. Really? Yes, really, I sighed. Annie, you need to understand that right now, nobody in this house harbors much affection toward you. She began to respond, but I raised a hand. Let me finish and be honest with you. First, you engage in a long-term sexual affair, concealing it from both Sally and me. Then, you blindsided me with divorce papers out of nowhere. When I became unresponsive, or as Sally calls it, checkout mode, you resorted to yelling, screaming, and even slapping me. Annie's expression was that of a deer caught in headlights. Yes, I remember most of that time until shortly after you struck me. But let's not stop there. You then abandon me while I'm in that state until Sally discovers me upon returning home, I continued, watching Annie's panic escalate. When Sally contacts you, you display no concern for my well-being despite her obvious distress. You never once inquire about my health until tonight, and even then, your demands of my workplace are unreasonable. Yet, when you arrive here, it's still all about you. You ask Sally for forgiveness without ever offering an apology to her, I paused, gauging her reaction. So, yes, Annie, I'd say things went remarkably well. Annie's gaze fell to the floor, tears welling in her eyes. They hadn't yet spilled over, but they hovered on the brink. I couldn't discern if they were for Sally, myself, or solely for her. Pressing on, I stated, our divorce will be finalized tomorrow, and unless you have anything further to say, I believe we've honored your request for a final meeting. I opened the door, inviting her to leave. Annie glanced at me before exiting. Arthur, we did have some good years, didn't we? She mused. Yes, Annie, most of our time together was wonderful. You were a devoted lover, a caring wife, and a loving mother. I'm not sure what influence this Paul character has had on you, but the person standing before me bears little resemblance to the woman I once knew. All I see now is someone who's been manipulated into becoming overweight, selfish, and indifferent to those around them, I expressed honestly. Her gaze dropped once more. 
You truly mean that, Arthur. Yes, I do, I affirmed. As she turned to leave, she paused, looking shattered. Arthur, about the house. Paul said I should ask? So, that was the true purpose of her visit. It wasn't about reconnecting with her family, it was solely about money. I chuckled, leaving Annie perplexed. Tell your soulmate that your share of the savings and the equity from this house will be in the bank account your lawyer provided to Rhonda by this time tomorrow. And Annie. I met her gaze. Protect that money from Paul, or you lose it before you know it. The next morning marked the finality of the divorce between Annie and me. While a small part of me felt a tinge of sadness, overall, I was relieved. The past few months had been challenging for everyone involved. Now, at 48, I felt liberated, knowing there was still plenty of life ahead of me. Rhonda called to inform me that she'd treat us to pizza at my place that evening. Sally swung by my office for lunch, and we reminisced about happier times as a family. Despite her strained relationship with her mother, I sensed Sally missed the woman she once knew. Honestly, I did too. We shared many good years together. Later, Tina's actions seemed to suggest a signal between her and Sally. Shortly after Sally left, Tina summoned me to her office and initiated a passionate kiss. I reciprocated, and amidst the fervor, she asked, Can I claim you as mine now, Arthur? Feeling a slight soreness on my neck from her earlier affection, I replied, I think you may have already done that. Dinner that night was joyful, with Sally, Rhonda, Tina, and Clarice celebrating my newfound freedom from Annie. Later, when the girls were asleep, Tina and I consummated our relationship. Everything seemed right, and Tina's lingering soreness over the weekend hinted at our shared passion. Six months later, we exchanged vows in a beautiful lakeside ceremony with many colleagues in attendance. We had hoped to marry later, but we wanted to welcome our son into a married household alongside Sally and Clarice. Five years on, while dining out with Sally, her partner, and Tina, Keegan, our five-year-old son, noticed someone staring at us. Turning around, we saw Annie, noticeably thinner but looking unhappy. We hadn't heard from her since the divorce, and she hadn't attempted to contact Sally. Excusing myself, I approached Annie. Hi, Annie. Hi, Arthur. How are you? Glancing at her food, she confessed, You were right, Arthur. Paul convinced me I was his soulmate and manipulated me. When I didn't get the money up front, he persuaded me to gain weight because he preferred overweight women. I ignored your advice and gave him the divorce settlement. He squandered it in six months and then left me. Although I harbored resentment, her tale lacked the happy resolution mine had. Since then, I've been trying to rebuild the confidence he shattered and reclaim some semblance of the person I used to be. Tears welled up in her eyes as she turned to me, and for a moment, I saw glimpses of the Annie I once knew. Arthur, I am deeply sorry. I treated you horribly. I allowed myself to believe that Paul knew better than you, and I left the man who truly loved me in a vulnerable state. You could have lost your life because of my actions. I know forgiveness may never come, but I want you to know how truly sorry I am. Her tears flowed freely now. To my surprise, Sally had approached and stood beside me, also hearing her mother's apology. I glanced at Sally, and she gave me a tired smile, squeezing my hand. Perhaps it was time, or maybe Sally sensed her mother's genuine remorse for the first time. Her demeanor softened, and she reached out to Annie. Seeing Sally's gesture, Annie attempted to flee in panic, but Sally stood her ground, blocking her way. Mom, please stay. You don't have to leave. Sally slid into the booth next to Annie, and I took the seat on the other side. Catching Tina's nod, we allowed mother and daughter to converse for the next hour. There were tears shed, but this time, they were healing tears, not tears of hurt. Once they caught up, Sally and I brought Annie over to meet everyone else. I could sense Annie's discomfort when introduced to Keegan as Auntie Annie. From that day on, we slowly welcomed Annie back into our lives. Sally and her mother rekindled their relationship gradually, meeting for coffee every week or two. Trust was rebuilt over time. When Sally got married, Annie proudly played the role of mother of the bride. Tina occasionally invited Annie over for dinner, 
initially perhaps out of spite, considering what Annie had lost and Tina had gained by marrying me. However, their relationship evolved into a peculiar friendship that I never quite understood. Rhonda, however, never forgave Annie for her actions, though she remained cordial in their interactions. As for me, with Tina's support, Annie and I sought post-marriage counseling to address our past issues. We delved into the events of five years ago. The counselors suggested hormonal imbalances as a possible factor, but Annie dismissed it outright. No, I made a grave mistake that day. I had a loving husband and a daughter who wanted my presence. No hormonal imbalance can justify how I dismantled everything good in my life for someone who turned out to be nothing more than a disappointment in bed. I owe Arthur and Sally so much better. She smiled wistfully at me. It took me five years to reconcile, five years that I lost with them. I'm grateful every day that Arthur has allowed me back into his life. And Tina, too. She blushed slightly. She had every reason to despise me, yet she's shown me warmth every time we've met. I realize now that she ended up with everything I foolishly discarded, and I'll carry that regret for a long time. Annie gained a lot from our counseling sessions, perhaps more than I did. It was reassuring to confirm that neither Sally nor I were to blame for Annie's departure. Tina played a crucial role in lifting us up and forging a stronger family bond. They say karma catches up eventually, and it certainly did for Paul. He ventured into the next state, once again attempting to seduce a married woman for her money. However, this time, the husband caught wind of it and dealt with Paul severely. Rhonda hinted that the husband might be out of prison soon, fueling rumors about his revenge on Paul. Tina and I are still deeply in love. I never thought I could love anyone as intensely as I did Annie, but Tina proved me wrong. She not only showered me with her love, but also bared her soul to me without reservation. We continue working together in her company, and I remain in the same position. We have our share of ups and downs, but we always prioritize communication. Tina's beauty still captivates me, and our passion remains alive, often indulging in lovemaking, even in exotic locations during vacations. Just one glance is all it takes for me to whisk her away to the bedroom. Once, after a passionate encounter, we joined Sally and Annie in the kitchen. We recently learned that Sally was expecting, adding excitement to the room as the girls discussed plans for my first grandchild. Sally, honestly, your dad and Tina are like teenagers sometimes. Tina, you must tell me your secret. Maybe I can share it with Fred. Annie teased. The girls chuckled, and I felt my cheeks flush. Annie had been dating casually, but nothing serious until Fred entered the picture. Mom, give them a break. We all know that Dad's been on a mission since his checkout incident. Sally teased, mischief glinting in her eyes. Annie looked taken aback, Sally laughed, and Tina blushed. I simply leaned back, amused by my girls, and felt a surge of desire looking at Tina. Excusing myself, I headed back to the bedroom, with Tina following suit and locking the door behind her. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel not to miss new videos.